Um, I, I was not expecting my presentation to segue so well into some of the stuff that's already been said. I'm here to talk with you guys a bit about spider threats and the con and conservation of spiders through the lens of uh, global experts. I had a short presentation, but uh, I, uh, and it already said most of it. I work with technology conservation, bioinformatics, and machine learning. Um, you guys might recognize, recognize me or not through some publications, namely I updated the Iberian spider checklist and I wrote uh, species conservation profiles for um, endemic Portuguese species. Uh, both uh, papers are <laughs> really good at lack of a better, of a better word. Uh, a key um, thing that holds back uh, the, the papers and I think our technology in general is lack of information. Um, and information can be in a lack of information about the species identity, their distribution, their variability and abundance, and their ec ecology and sensitivity. So these are, are this is fairly no, well known. Um, so what I'd like to ask you guys is how we can tackle such a critical lack of information. Uh, and I'd suggest that we could consult and refine new sources of information. It could be scientific literature that we don't have available to us yet. It can be great literature, or we can try to simplify uh, our research problems uh, through the use of new models and machine learning, like I've taken the first steps in doing. But overall, uh, the, the big idea is that we should do the best with what we have. And I give as just an overly elaborate example this um, picture that I created for Deep Dream Generator. I took a black and white picture of Agna Ingens, then I gave a, uh, another picture with a similar uh, color scheme that the original spider has. And the algorithm tries to, uh, I'd say, add color to, to, to the picture, doing the best it can with the information it has at hand. So when it, formal scientific knowledge is missing, uh, it makes a lot of sense to study how indigenous people, field practitioners, and other conservation enthusiasts interpret current Koenigans as their sources of information. At the very least, this allows us to get a free stream of what is being done, uh, taught, and thought. Uh, and it's a methodology that has been used before to create some very well-regarded published literature, namely the IPAS reports. So in order to uh, paint a picture of what these field practitioners uh, think about uh, spider conservation, we collected the opinion of 100 spider experts and enthusiasts, which I'll try to uh, shorten just to experts from now on. Uh, and we asked them uh, what were the most relevant threats facing spider species and what conservation actions were the most relevant to prevent uh, population and species declines. And then we reviewed the state of the art uh, on these threats and conservation measures to, to see what was already established. Uh, we, we did this by creating a query uh, in December last year, which uh, started by uh, being sent to diverse arachnological societies, such as the African Arachnological, Arachnological Society and the European Society of Arachnology, but it expanded past that. Uh, it was composed of different questions, open-ended questions, and multiple choice questions, uh, where we tried to get our threat and conservation measure categories to follow as close as possible the IUCN classification schemes. These are the threat categories. I will be focusing on the ones in bold, although you can ask any sort of question about uh, any of these threats as I have the, the slides for that. And the same for conservation measures. I'll be focusing on these three, land protection, education, awareness, law and policy. And uh, so that you guys don't get confused, I'm focusing on these uh, threats and conservation measures because they're the ones that were most relevant for the neotropical region. Unfortunately, there was a fairly significant geographic, geographical bias. Uh, most of our respondents had expertise uh, most of our experts, sorry, had expertise on the Palearctic and the Nearctic regions. And we did a Permanova analysis uh, to determine which of several demo demography categories uh, significantly impacted the responses, uh, the relevance responses that we got from one to five, 
not relevant at all to most relevant, being that the only one that was significant was the region. So let's start with threats. These are the global results. Uh, the four uh, most relevant threats globally, agriculture, livestock farming and forestry, climate change, urbanization and pollution. Uh, for the neotropics, uh, two, two threats I'd consider are very regionally specific, although, it, for example, hunting and trapping tends to also be very relevant in other regions, but uh, two I, I'd say is uh, mining and, and quarrying, mining and energy, energy production, um, and hunting and trapping. These two are, are very uh, regionally specific and relevant. So let's start with the first one, uh, agriculture, livestock farming, and forestry. The biggest takeaway from uh, our revision of state of the art, land use change implies spider change. So in a, a kind of at worst case scenario, tropical case study, it was found that density, richness, functional diversity, and community predation are all drastically reduced across a gradient uh, from rainforest to oil palm monoculture with some guild variation, of course, but this is the tendency. In an at best scenario, uh, farming practices such as weeding and mulching can uh, shift spider communities. Uh, however, we, we have to, to, to point out that most management options and scenarios have negative effects on both spider richness and abundance in agroecosystems. Uh, this isn't as evident in forests and the most likely causes of these negative effects is attributed commonly to direct killing of spiders and negative effects on habitat heterogeneity uh, and pre-populations. Habitat heterogeneity being a very common theme uh, in, our, in our results. For urbanization, which uh, was the third place globally in terms of relevance and second place for the neotropics, the effects of urbanization are also very complex and require careful interpretation. Uh, because similarly to agriculture and livestock farming, it induces shifts in spider communities. So urbanized areas have greater proportions and richness of land dwelling open habitat spider species, but a decrease in the richness of forest dwelling spiders. So big takeaway overall, uh, spider richness is not an appropriate indicator of disturbance for the group. Uh, additionally, uh, urbanization might also affect spider traits, as uh, it was found that in a common oloarctic species, uh, fecundity and body size changed along an urbanization gradient, and web structure, web structure changes were also present, presumably to account for a lower quantity of prey. Now, pollution. Uh, pollution and pesticides have become very, very recent and, and controversial uh, topics, I'd say, uh, especially in invertebrate conservation. Uh, the, the, there is a case that we give here as an example that in Romania, um, species richness and density were found to be negatively associated with in-stream pesticide toxicity. Uh, toxins and pesticides might have both the, uh, direct impacts, uh, such as individual deaths, and indirect impacts, such as prey availability, that you, you, we need to start considering. Uh, and all of these are uh, examples of effects that are present um, in, in our uh, bibliography review. Uh, Non-lethal effects can be short-term predatory activity, uh, sex-specific changes, increased excise, Etc. Uh, let's uh, now for the first, I'd say, major regional threat. It, although it's only this in the seventh place in terms of relevance globally, it's uh, it is much higher up in the neotropics, and it's mining. Uh, as some of you might have guessed from experience, uh, it is a frequent threat for troglobion species. Uh, not not only, but uh, I'd say very relevant to uh, limestone quarries are often in competition or adjacent to cave systems, and they can intentionally or accidentally uh, alter the, the environment, the habitats of uh, troglobion species, uh, potentially driving subpopulations, even eventually species to extinction. Uh, this is because something as small as a, as a small change like 
increasing um, at the entrance of a cave can uh, increase wind flow, which per se uh, increases uh, or change, sorry, changes temperature and relative humidity, which can put pressure on troglobin species, which are very um, specialized to, to their, let's say, stable environment. Um, hunting and trapping is another very regionally specific um, threat. Globally, it's not, not very much well considered, um, although regionally, absolutely. And both Milenko and Carol's uh, presentation next will 100% talk better about this than I, I can. But as, as you could have guessed, experts have expressed concerns over the illegal trafficking that mostly uh, uh, megalomorphs suffer, which is commonly found on, on global traffic networks. Um, it, this is very relevant, as I just said, in the neotropics and in the Malayan regions. And the main loss of individuals is usually adults, which are uh, higher, have higher demand in, in the trades than, than juveniles. Uh, and at least 14 species of, of Brachyphelma are seated on, on site, are under decline because of this. Our experts uh, told us about other threats, uh, socio-political problems such as corruption, apathy and prejudice against spiders, poor management practices and lack of information about taxonomy threats and spider life history. Uh, and overall, these were, sorry, I forgot to say, these were on the open-ended questions. And overall, people uh, expressed their concern over irresponsible political action. Let's go for conservation measures. Uh, the, the, the biggest or the most relevant conservation measures, according to our experts, were land protection, education and awareness, and land management. Uh, regionally, there's a big... Uh, big emphasis being put on law and policy in the neotropics. And let's go over them. Uh, land protection, most spiders uh, benefit from a low human footprint. So this one is fairly obvious as it is an efficient way to, to guarantee uh, conditions to, to, to spider species. And it can act as a kind of, uh, a, land, a protected area can act as a kind of buffer for threats such as climate change, wildfires and exotic species. Education and awareness uh, is another big conservation measure. Traditional methods of science communication, so zoos, science, center, science centers, museums, etc., continue to be relevant. And new forms of ed education and awareness, uh, such as local citizen science projects and national projects, um, are, still, uh, are still, and I'd say, becoming even more relevant in the case of, of citizen science projects. Uh, for the regional uh, relevant one, law and policy, uh, there's uh, a fair number of, of spider species uh, covered by policy. However, we, we would like to see much more, uh, but these vary in terms of uh, the, the scope of the policy. Uh, there are spiders uh, uh, protected under international agreements, such as Brachyphelma auratum, uh, regional agreements such as Macrotel Calpiana and national or regional law such as Psilocor Jesprus, which respectively are protected by the SITCH, uh, Natura 2000, and the COSEWAC uh, under Canadian national law. So, uh, to conclusion uh, of, of all of this, um, Trends in the neotropics uh, tend to be similar to global trends, but uh, our experts brought light to some uh, potential specific challenges. Um, hunting and trapping and energy production and mining are the big ones. Uh, however, uh, the, the, the bigger takeaway of all of this is that uh, when faced with a great lack of information, we would encourage you to careful, but carefully but still engage with amateur groups, field workers, indigenous people, and among other, um, other kinds of people uh, as these can be good sources of information and shouldn't just be uh, discarded. They can paint a picture that even if it's not going to be uh, exactly what we wanted as, as, as scientists can still be very relevant. So as acknowledgements, I'd like to uh, thank Kone for, for funding me and big thanks to Boris Leroy who reviewed, re reviewed our results and brought this attention to the IPISH reports. 
and thank you for your attention.